hide this. And I think ready to go. All right. So good afternoon. It's afternoon when I'm recording this. This is on a very rainy, rainy Thursday. So uh, once again, here's Dora. Like, Although we get out regularly, the weather has been such, we haven't gotten to a lot of different parks. We keep going to Frog Pond and down to the Dingle, maybe the Long Lake. But uh, in the spring, summer, fall, we get out to all kinds of different parks. So this is actually from back in December. Dora and I were at what's known as the Macintosh Run Single Track Trails. Um, if you know Halifax and you know where J.L. Ilsley High School is in Spryfield, it's just out beyond that uh, on the other side of a new subdivision called, I think Governor's Brook it's called. And it's a very, very large swath of land. Um, there are a number of different wilderness areas and parks that sort of come together. Uh, this particular one, it had a forest fire a number of years back. And so no trees. It's very desolate looking. Uh, lots of granite boulders and that type of thing. And they've developed an incredible network of mountain bike trails. I don't mountain bike. But they're great trails, really well marked, good signage, everything else. It's a delightful area to go and walk. And it's, uh, although I like trees and forests and that sort of thing, this one, which is very barren looking, uh, it's almost like after a war zone type of thing, and it's starting to rebuild. Well, it's a forest that is coming back. Um, it's very peaceful and relaxing in its own way. Good place. You should explore some of these places. So a few things that are going on uh, this week on Tuesday, I mentioned before, uh, Tarek Haddad will be speaking as a, a, an immigrant entrepreneur, that a few things that might be of interest to you when thinking of the summer, that there are summer research opportunities. Now the prof has to uh, uh, apply uh, and propose a project that would fund a student research assistant. And they, uh, in turn, students then apply to the various positions. But you should look into it. Uh, that uh, a lot of them are in science, but there are still a number that are in SOBE and in arts. And they make use of students with a, quite a range of different skill sets. There's also a summer job and career fair that's coming up on the 8th, so that's week after. Uh, but start thinking ahead for the summer that you may have had a job that you can go back to every summer, that type of thing. But if you want variety and experience and build your resume, it's worth exploring what are alternatives. And now's the time of year you gotta start looking at it. A few other things coming up. Uh, we have one of our students in taking this at my uh, daytime class. Uh, she's on the women's volleyball team, so I'd like to promote her next game, February the 4th, uh, 2 p.m. And a few workshops. There's one on working and studying in groups. It'd be interesting to see what they cover in that. Uh, group work, yeah, it's an important aspect of things beyond university, but generally they're not like groups we have for student projects. And, uh, in business groups work on projects, but they've got a team lead. Uh, they've got resources to support them. Teams and sports have got a coach. So there's a structure around them. Our group work tends to be very unstructured and can be very frustrating, but there may be some insights into how to do that. Uh, there is a, uh, Black Business Initiatives and Sophie School of Business, um, uh, Rural Black Businesses Series that's la being launched on February 6th. I know very, very little about this. The BBI has been around for a very long time. Uh, very uh, good, strong organization. But I think this is taking place at the airport. I'm not sure why. And what is Monday? Monday is National Draw Dinosaur Day. 
So it's not just January 30th, it's a special day. <laughs> anyway, a um, few bits, test one results. I can't tell you anything about it because you haven't written it yet, not when I'm recording this, but once you have, and I do have some things on that, I will be feeding it back to you. Uh, if you've missed the quiz or the test, get after me. Did you do the quiz on Saturday? If you didn't, get back to me and soon. And I may be able to do something, but you've got to act quickly. You can't just put it off. Uh, you've got an assignment coming up that's due on February the 3rd, I think it is. And uh, I will do a tutorial through Zoom at 1 o'clock on Tuesday. Most students likely will not attend the live session, but I will record it and post it on Top Hat. Your assignment one is posted on Top Hat right now, as well as a sample assignment that's similar in terms of tasks from a couple of years ago. And there's detailed information on that sample as well as to how it's done, not just what the answers are, but a video of how I got those answers. That uh, but before observing the tutorial, if you really are intent on learning things and not just getting it done, and it, I would strongly encourage you to attempt as many questions as you can before the tutorial, and then uh, go back over questions you've done, look at the tutorial and see did you approach it the right way, or questions you got stuck on and see if they're good clues within the tutorial to help you get over those obstacles. If you still have questions about the assignment, I'd encourage you to email me. And if it's an Excel problem that you've got, you should be attaching the whole Excel spreadsheet to your email when you send it to me. Okay. All right. So uh, last class, Move my little head around here. It's very common to summarize data with just a few simple measures. Where's the middle? What's low? What's high? That how spread out is the data? Those types of things. Uh, there are a lot of good features to do with the median as a measure of the middle, but most people use the mean, so get used to it. Percentiles and quartiles are sometimes nice as tools to flag the top and the bottom, high values, low values, that type of thing. But there's no, although there's a standard definition of what a percentile is or a quartile is, there's no standard definitions of what is a low number and what's a high number, what's very low or what's very high. Standard deviation is a very difficult thing to wrap your head around. That, uh, it measures the variability diversity of the individual observations, how variable they are. And I mentioned standard error, and it's a measure of variability of estimates. And this is a very curious type of thing. Uh, normally, like you can observe the variability in your sample, but, and we can measure that, but with estimates, like the sample mean, we only calculate one of them. How can I talk about variability or uh, diversity of those? How do you measure it when you've only seen one? You saw $53,000 as being our estimate of the mean. So, and I, I can understand that if I went out and collected another data set, I'd probably get a different average out of that different data set. But how would I tell how big a difference it would be? That's rather curious. Turns out there is, there's a whole bunch of theory. We won't get into it. But the standard error is just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And this measures variability in estimates, how accurate they are, how far off your estimate might be from the correct answer. And it says that as you get more information, bigger sample size, the standard error will go small, get smaller. But it's connected to the square root of it. So doubling your sample size doesn't give you something that's twice as accurate. But still, better estimates, if you want to measure something better, you need more data. That if your population that you're studying is incredibly diverse, everybody's wildly different, it's really hard to get a good estimate because 
the data is all over the place. If everybody was the same, it would be really easy to measure what's the average of them if they were all the same. So the uh, standard error, our ability to estimate things accurately, depends upon how diverse the group is that you're studying. So just to show it to you in this one, with this one, we had the mean being 52,915. And if we went and did another survey, we'd get a different result. If we did another, we'd get a different result. If we could have gotten, you know, there were 800 and some people answered this survey, but we had six or 7,000 students at the time. And if we could have gotten all 6,000 to answer the survey, well, then we'd be able to estimate that mean precisely. We could say the average expectation of St. Mary's undergraduate students is some number. But we didn't get all of those. So we've got that true value, but we don't know what it is. We've got our estimate, and we'd like to know how close are those two. And that's where standard error comes in. How close is it? So if I use that formula I just showed you, it ends up being 1,607. Okay, what does that tell me? Use empirical rule. Two thirds of the time, our estimate is within $1,600 of the correct answer, which we don't know. And 95% of the time, or twice that amount, that's $3,200. We're, we're, we're about $3,200 away from the correct answer, okay? Or no more than that, 95% of the time, we went out from the correct answer, went out $3,000 this way, that way. Um, those are the typical estimates we would get. Ours is probably one of those ones. So our best guess is $53,000. And if we're saying, well, you know, you're saying that's just an estimate, what? How far off could you be? You might say, well, I'm pretty confident that it's at least $49,000, $50,000, and it's probably no more than $56,000. It's still a broad range, but I'm saying it's definitely not $40,000 or forty-five, dollars and it's definitely not sixty or $70,000. It's, I think, average is somewhere between about fifty and fifty-six. dollars So standard deviation tells me about variability of my data how big a difference you'll typically find between different values. And the standard error tells me about the variability or uncertainty in estimates of a mean. Take a while for that type of thing to sink in. We'll be coming back to this a number of times. Now, in the live class I mentioned to you last week, we do a few questions on Monday. So here's a histogram, okay? Boom, 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 boom. And it was a bunch of data. And I'd like to know for that histogram, would you think that the mean is bigger than the median? Clearly bigger, not just a little bit. Or the mean is clearly less than the median? The median and the mean are maybe about the same size? Or you can't tell which is clearly better? It is definitely uh, greater, should I say. So where do you think they should be? Boom, 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 In class, people answer, and a whole bunch will pick different answers. If we look at this, this data is relatively balanced left and right. So the left-hand side and the right-hand side look similar. Bumpy, but similar. So the median is probably right here in the middle. And the mean which averages these sorts of things that are on balance, it'll also be roughly in the middle. If it's a symmetrical distribution, the left and right look about the same, the mean and the median are the same. If there was a long tail to the right, that will pull the mean over to the right and pull it away from the median. And if there's a long tail to the left, it'll pull the mean to the left of the median. Tails pull the mean around. This one doesn't, it seems reasonably balanced, so they should be about the same. Okay. That's the answer C. Let's go to the next guy. Which is not true about histograms. They're often very lumpy, even for large samples. They are generally symmetrical and bell-shaped. 
They are a visual display of how diverse the data values are. They are often skewed with a long tail to the left or to the right. Okay. Well, the one I just showed you a second ago um, actually was used a lot of data. And you'll notice that it still bounced all over the place. Yeah, they're generally lumpy, even for big samples that just, they fluctuate. Are they generally symmetrical, like that one I just showed you? No. That if it's particularly financial data, there's almost always a long tail to the right. There's a whole bunch of really big values for it. If I was looking at sales information um, by stores and that type of thing, again, I'm going to find there's where most are, and then there's some really big guys. But we generally are truncated on the bottom end. We can't go down below zero. And a lot of data that we measure, particularly in business, um, just it, it has that long tail to the right. But occasionally we get ones that have a long tail to the left. And so if I, in your assignment, you have to do, take a look at the grade data, of grade point averages students reported. There you've got one with a tail that's to the left of it. It is a visual display. That's what a histogram is all about. And it is to show you the diversity of your data. So that's true. And as I said, it usually has a long tail. B is the one that's wrong. Third one here for you, the mean and the median are always approximately the same, are both affected by a small numbers of extremely large or small values, are both measures of the middle and all of the above. Well, we know they're both measures of the middle. Okay. Um, are they both affected by a small number of lar super large or small values? No. The median doesn't care about the large values, doesn't care about the small values, only cares about the middle ones. So it's not affected by anything on the extremes, but the mean definitely is. Are they always approximately the same? Not if you got a long tail. If you got a long tail, the mean's going to get pulled away from the median. If it's symmetrical, yeah, they're both about the same. But if it's not symmetrical, no, they're quite different. So unfortunately, you don't get a chance to ask me questions in class because this is not synchronous, but you can always email me questions. So what are we doing on day seven and eight? This is, we're moving from having a single variable and understanding one variable and understanding it well to looking at the relationships among variables or comparing different groups with respect to something, which is like two variables there again. And we're going to be using a tool in Excel that's really good at doing this type of thing. It's super easy to use, and it's also very complicated. You end up having to make a whole bunch of different decisions about how you build that table and format it. And that makes it complicated. But it's easy to do, and we'll see that. Okay? So um, we're going to be using it to do a lot of the things we just did with the uh, Excel's analysis toolkit. It's a really clumsy toolkit. And uh, a lot of tools that are out there for doing basic exploration, I find very clumsy. Uh, pivot tables are super simple and easy. That in, to do the one that we had before, if I want to compare groups, I'd have to pull out the data for one group, pull out the data for the other group, do stuff and then try to combine it. Messy. These ones are specifically, the pivot table is specifically designed for summarizing it in a table. And a pivot chart is to take that table and turn it into a picture. And so we'll look at both. We're going to focus on the table today. At the end, I'll talk about the picture. And next class, we'll do everything with a table and a picture at the same time. So to do this, what we have to do is when we go into Excel, that click on any cell in our table and go up to insert. And where before we pick table to make it into a table, this time we will click on pivot table, okay? 
and it will come back. Oh, along the way, it's going to go and try to guess, well, where is the data? And it's really good at guessing where it is. It'll generally, if it's already in a table, it'll say, you want the whole table? If it's not in a table, then it's going to expect a, a rectangle of data. Okay. So if you've got some data and then you've got some blank rows or blank columns, it'll have trouble knowing that it's supposed to jump over those. It doesn't like those blanks when you're starting out and building it. So uh, you would have to tell it, just like when constructing a table to begin with, where it's located. But it's usually get good at guessing it. When you get it, you'll get a table that's blank and empty. And over on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to get a, um, a thing that we're going to pull things from. It's going to have a thing called pivot table fields. It's a list of every single variable that you've got. What if you didn't put names at the top of every column? Let's suppose it wasn't in a table. A table has labels for every column. If yours wasn't in a table and you had one that had a blank up there, you're going to have trouble. That the pivot table may not work. If you had two columns with the same name, again, pivot table won't work. This is just like a table. Every column has to have a name and it has to have a unique name, a unique label, or you'll get a message saying you've got problems. Because those labels become now called what I've been calling a variable are now called fields, okay. another piece of jargon. And you'll get a list of all these different fields that are there. The, then you've got four boxes down below. And the boxes are what's in the columns, what's in the rows. So um, maybe I'm trying to look at um, that what program you're in and what your gender is. So maybe in my table, I'm going to have gender for the columns, program for the rows. What do you want to know about that? What are the values you're summarizing? Oh, well, maybe I'm going to want to look at what's the average salary of women in arts to look at, compare that to women in business or science or men in arts or business and science. So down here I'd, in values, I'd probably be putting in uh, salary that I want to study. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to then say I want average salary. So it's what do you want to summarize in your table? And you'll also have to tell it how you want it summarized. And then filters is a tool for saying, mm, yeah, but I don't want those crazy numbers. We know that some students gave us values that were not appropriate. And so I can use filters like we had in the table before. I can put filters now and I'll summarize them all here. I do like this because it tells me what I'm filtering on. Whereas in a table, I kept having to go to that top row and see that little symbol to tell me, oh, I've been filtering on something. Okay. And so we're going to drag program over and put it here in the rows. I'm going to drag gender, put it in the columns. I'm going to drag salary down into the values box. It's going to give me a sum of salary. Okay, this is getting messy. So let's get into Excel and see what it does for me. Okay, so here we are. Let me hide these controls again. Okay, so here was my sheet. So I'm going to go click on something, anything there. I'm going to go over here to insert. Okay, get you out of the way. And as you say, there's pivot table here is one of my options. So I'll click on it. Come on, there it is. So it's going to take my table. Uh, I'm going to put it in a new worksheet. I always put things in new worksheets, or almost always. Um, and I'm going to click OK. So this is the sheet that I was telling you about. Over here on the left is the table I'm going to create, but I have nothing in it. 
over on the right, I'm going to say what I want in my table. So I think I said I want program to be in the rows. So I just clicked on it on program. I came up here, I grabbed it, pulled it down, dropped it into rows. Okay. So there's my programs, and including the values I really don't like. And I want gender in the columns. So there, let me scroll down. There's gender. So let me put gender in the columns. There I've got blanks, female, male, total. And I want salary to be in values. There it's given me sum of salary. Okay. That that's really not what I want. So there are different ways we can go about fixing things and hiding things up as we go. I could go over here to the values, click on some here, and you'll notice a box comes up. And one of them is called value field settings. So I could click on that one. And I've got this box here. It says, how do I want to summarize numbers? Well, I want average. I don't want count or sum. So I'll click on average, and it gives me averages. These are ugly looking numbers. So I could go down back to value field settings, and I could go and change the number format. And I could say it's a number with two decimal places. Um, I could make it currency with a dollar sign. I probably do, did that in the notes, but I'm going to use number because I just find the dollar signs give me extra clutter. I do like separators, though. Okay? And you'll find I don't like decimals. I don't like too many digits. So I generally put my decimals down to zero unless it's really small numbers, 0 0.038. Okay, that one, I'm not, if I hide the decimals, I get zero. If it's a tiny number, then I'll, I'll show the decimals. But if it's big numbers, I don't. And click OK. And then I've got to click OK again. So this is a little tidier and easier to look at. You could have done it other ways. And what we could have done is taken any number in the middle of my table and right click on it. And you would find number formatting. That's just what we did a second ago. Or summarize values by. And there are other types of things in here as well. And we'll be using that later. For now, we'll leave it. So this summarizes things a little better for me. But clean it up. That I can go and do various sorts of things. I can go and hide stuff. See, I had a down arrow here by the labels. So I could go and take some of these out. Invalid, not applicable. Yeah. And the blank column, ones that didn't tell me gender. So the column labels, blanks, I'm going to take that out. There's a simpler table for me. If you really want to go further, my, my column labels reflect gender. You can actually type over this. I didn't know you could do that. And the row labels are program. So I could do all kinds of stuff here and summarize things. So, and so the stuff I did previously of, you know, okay, males seem to earn more than, or expect to earn more than females in, in arts, in business, but not in science. Oh, okay. Um, art students expect to earn less than business, who expect to earn less than science. Uh, but we've got crazy numbers in here, remember? So let me go back. Take salary. I've got it in the values box, but I can also drag it into the filters box. I can have it in two places. And, and here, I'd like to filter, uh, filter, a filter box but it doesn't give me all kinds of filters i can't do the between or less than greater than any of those types of things i just get a list of all the values and i could click on select multiple values 
and I'm going to unclick numbers that I think are just way too low. I'm going to get rid of those that are below 10,000. And I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. And I'm going to get rid of the blanks. Well, the blanks aren't showing anyway. And these crazy, super big numbers. There aren't too many of them. So we'll just trim off those, the top six or eight values and bottom six or eight values. So we got the extremes out of the way. And that changes things. So now we've got about a 3,000 difference here. Here it's about, what's that, $5,000 difference between males and females in business. And in science, it looks like there's about a $7,000 difference. That's quite large. And the gaps now between arts and business, that's fairly large. That's about $5,000, a little more. And then between business and science, it's no longer up at $60,000. Um, but it's still $3,000 more than, uh, than business students. But here I can start seeing patterns within my data. And I could start exploring for other types of patterns within it. Warning, though, I just told you about estimates. These things are all estimates, okay? And that overall average now is shifted on us because of the ones I've trimmed out. It's now about $50,000, was $53,000 before. And I said that the estimates may be off by a bit either way. So I should be cautious about saying that there are big differences between arts, business, and science, or between men and women, it may be that it's just noise that's present. There's a lot of variability in my data. And if I collected another sample of data, maybe I wouldn't see those same patterns that are there. Oh, they're still interesting. I'm curious about them. I'd like to explore them. But I'm not sure, and you'd learn in a statistics course, whether or not you should believe the differences or not. So let me go back to my slides here. And we did those things. And we did those things. And we cleaned it up. And we filtered. And see, I had those dollars in there. Okay. So this is a little bit different here because I stopped at 10,000. And in the notes in the slides here, I stop at 20,000. So average is a little bit higher than I just showed you. So it depends upon what you pick, trim your data out. So you'll get into more detail in, in Management Science 2207 about trying to play with that. So I'd be curious to look at, hmm, do I have much data? Because remember the standard error, the accuracy of things, depends upon sample size. And I don't have 752 values anymore. I've split them up into six categories, and I've filtered a whole bunch out. So it's going to look quite different. That um, in this example here, what I did was I dragged the ID into my values box, and I did a count of that. We'll do that in a second. But you'll notice that I've only got, in this example, 526. So I've thrown out a lot of data, 225 or so observations have been thrown away. And now my sample sizes, so these estimates, this 53,000 here in science for women is only based upon 54 students, not 752 students. So it's not going to be that precise. There could be a lot of noise here. I shouldn't jump to conclusions in interpreting this. Okay. That, um, and if you looked at some of these ones that we've hidden, you know, we've had tiny numbers. So if you had started, if you hadn't paid attention to that, you looked at those that didn't tell us what program they were in, we'd be making conclusions based upon just a handful of data. We wouldn't have very, very accurate results. You should always be checking that I know the focus isn't, we want to look at average salaries, but we should always be checking how big a sample we have at any one time. So we'll do that, we'll go back and check those things. If you wanted to make the samples bigger, we could do it by combining some of the groups, like the ones that were invalid and not 
applicable. I could combine them and make them their own group of students that for some reason their data I'm not sure about and see are they different from those that told me arts, business, and science. So I could merge them together and we'll do that in a moment. Okay. And it merges it, it makes my table look different. I've got to clean it up. And then finally, I get my other category and I get some numbers. And they're all screwy numbers. The, notice how high it is for men, how low it is for women. So it's the highest group for the men, lowest group for the women. But look at my sample sizes. 49 women, here are only 21 men. So the estimates probably aren't very, very good here at all. And the fact that one of them is high, the other is low, yeah, it's just noise, randomness. That's all that's taking place here. So I can go and look at different things. I'm gonna look at a few different things. One of them I'm gonna look at in a minute is parent education. And why would I do that? Let's go and do that. So the I'm gonna jump ahead and I'm gonna look at parents' education. Okay. Why would I do that? I'm still leaving it male and female, not important. And here you'll find that we've got bachelor, college, doctorate, high school, masters, don't know, professional degree. Oh, I'm gonna get rid of the don't know, so I don't like them. There are no blanks, so I'm safe there. So it's a little smaller table. Still a lot of numbers you're looking at. You've got 12 different categories here. So that first of all, why am I looking at this? I should explain that. Uh, I think I may have mentioned previously to you that often it's hard to get data on a family's socioeconomic status. That we might be able to get at it indirectly or get an idea about it by the education level of the parents on the belief that the higher the level of education, probably the higher the income is. Generally, people that have higher education have average incomes that are higher. There's a, it's a regular pattern that we see. That's why we encourage you to go to school and go to university is your lifetime earnings generally are significantly higher. Um, so if you knew the student's parents' education, you would have a sense of their economic background, where they're coming from. That if you came from a well-to-do family, very successful parents, there might be an expectation that you would also be very successful and earn big bucks. That So if parents had a higher level of education, indicating that they were higher income, would you expect that student, their son or daughter, to also have um, those high expectations about earnings? So that's what we're looking at here. And that uh, it's hard to tell. This is on the left, the education that we've got here. This is, I call it program. It should be, let's give it a new name. So I changed it, parent education. That this is an ordinal variable. High school is less than college, which is less than a bachelor's degree, which is less than a master's, or professional degree, which is less than a doctorate. So let's reorder them, okay? Let's, uh, and we can do it in different ways. You click on it, click on say high school. Notice the cursor, as I move it around, it's a down arrow at the moment, it's a cross, it's another down arrow. If I move to the left, it's an arrow pointing to the right. I want it to be a cross. So I have to have the right type of symbol there before I can do anything. Now, right click on it and you get a whole bunch of different things to do. So I'm gonna ask to move it and I'm gonna move high school up to the beginning. Boom, there it is. Now, college should come before bachelor's. So grab it, see the cross, right click, remove and I'll move it up, boom, okay, it's into the right group. Then I got these other ones here down below, but if 
I was to go and grab, say, ID, put it in this thing here. Gives me strange things. Sum of ID. I don't want sum. Click on that sum. Right click. Summarize values by count. Ooh, doctorate. Not very many of them, 17 altogether. Professional degrees, like a law degree or something, only 18, not many of them. We've got a few with master's degrees, there's 76 of them, but still it's not all that many compared to those with other levels of education. It would be nice to just merge them together. Okay, so I can get a bigger sample. I may not be able to get the granularity, the detail on the education, but let's, I, I can't believe these estimates because the samples are too small. So I've got to combine them. So go on, click on that doctorate with the cross, hold down your control key, click on master, click on professional degree. So they're all highlighted at the same time. Now right click. So I'm not going to move them. I'm going to group them. Click on group. Okay, it forms a whole bunch of groups. There's a high school group that only includes high school. Click on the minus sign to reduce that. College only has college in it. Yeah, yeah, combine that. Let's collapse bachelors. And group one, I'm going to collapse. And give it a new name. Just click on it. Type. I'm going to call it graduate. Now my sample sizes are, they're still small, but they're better than they were before. Let me get this out of my way. It's just clutter. And so now I can look at as education level goes up of the parent, do salary expectations go up? <laughs> Not for women. <laughs> um, for men, now they're bouncing all over the place. There's no pattern here. Combining them, mm, yeah, maybe it's gone up in, a little, little tiny bit, but these are all bad estimates. There's no change here. This is interesting. It means that people from low-income families versus those with high-income families have similar expectations of what university is going to do for them. So in that respect, going to university is a leveler. It brings, particularly, it brings the bottom up, low-income people up to everybody else. And that's a desirable feature to reduce income disparities. Have us look more like Finland, not as cold, but <laughs> anyway, um, that was an interesting one. Other things that we might want to look at. So I've shown you what I did here. It's all in the slides. So I move things around and merge stuff together. And yeah, that, so some of these things out of the way. Watch it, averages or estimates. Okay. And they can be quite inaccurate. How bad? Standard error is our quick way of getting an idea about that. You take a statistics course, it'll get into a lot more detail about how to make decisions on how accurate your estimates are. That we can look at all kinds of different scenarios, we can look for patterns. At the moment we're looking at salary, but we could be looking at other variables and comparing them by different groups that as we explore it though if you want that table to talk to you well then you've got to make it neat and tidy it can't be a messy room okay that the things you're not using put them away so not sure don't know not applicable blank hide them put them out of the way that the uh some of the other types of things that you've done, like formatting the numbers. You don't need too many digits. Just show what's important. Watch out when you're doing some of the filters. Oops, I'm sorry, this is in the wrong place. Anyway, that you have a bunch of filters in here. But, um, this question is in the wrong spot in my slide deck. I've got to move it. I thought I did that. Anyway. Um, we could look at other types of things that are ordinal and so on. One of the ones I looked at was uh, what year students started at St. Mary's. 
because this was of all students. I had first year students, second year, third year, fourth year students. And that um, the survey was done in the winter of 2010. So if you started in 2009, you're in first year. Those that started in 2008, right. second year, and so on. Um, so I could look at the relationship between when did you start your studies and what your expectations are. And for the most part, they're all pretty similar, except for men, it looks like, in 2009, which may just be an outlier in that year. Or it may be that hmm, if you're in your first year university and I'm asking you, okay, this is 2023, and you're going to graduate in 2026, I hope, um, that and I'm looking at two years later, so that'd be in 2028. And I asked you, what do you think you'd be earning in 2028? Are you gonna be, a, I don't even know what type of job I'm gonna get, what the labor market's gonna look like, I have no idea. Um, so you're maybe you're just making a number up. Whereas if you're a student that's in their fourth year and you're just about to graduate, you've been hopefully out doing job interviews and researching jobs. And you should have a very good idea of what type of pay you can get starting. And if you need your starting pay, you might have an idea of what you might earn two years later. Um, so maybe they've got more reliable estimates. So first year students probably have the worst estimates of their earnings. And maybe that's what's showing up here anyway. But looking at it and trying to show it, I just showed it as a chart hmm. that the, why would you use a chart instead of a table? Hmm. Well, think about it for a second. I'm trying to get a sense of patterns that are there. What's the pattern between when you started your education and how much you're going to earn, what's the pattern between men and women, differences between their expectations. And when I'm looking for pattern, am I, do I care about precise numbers? Did I care that these things were around $50,000 or would it matter if it was around 60 or around 40? When I'm looking for the pattern, I'm looking for differences. Our numbers bigger or smaller. So you could be looking here at you know, these different numbers. It's really busy. There's five digits to each of those numbers. To process the patterns that are there between 47 and 45 and 48, I'm ignoring the last three digits. Then it's down to 47, then it's up to 51. And over here, boom, 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 looking at the different numbers. It's very busy. And if I'm looking down here and across at the same time, just to get a sense of pattern, it's a lot of work. But if you just gave me a simple picture, I could look at, oh, the orange bars look to be taller than the blue ones. And I think the bars are going up. So recent graduates expect more than older graduates and men might expect more than women. What were the numbers? When I just described that, I could cover up the scale that's over here on the left. I could hide it and you could still see the pattern. Pictures are really good to understand patterns. Um, as I said, my slides seem to be jumbled. One of the things to remember is as you're working along and doing these sorts of things, that there are sometimes little funnels that show up in the fields list. I'll show you that in Excel in a second. <clears throat> and I'll show you how I got that chart in a second. That those funnels uh, give me an idea whether or not the, there is a filter on that variable. Filtering by just saying I hide those ones from me, or it's something that's in my filter box. The ones in my filter box are easy to see. But with gender, we hid the blanks parental education we hit the ones that we're not sure don't know that there may be other things okay 
that that slide that should have been before. I'll have to fix that. That remember, as we get into this, and I'll show you this chart in a minute, if I make changes in my table, it'll automatically show up in my chart. And I can actually make changes in my chart, and they will show up in my table. But we'll look at a lot of that stuff next class. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I've got a summary, but let me get back to our dear friend in Excel. So let me hide this. Even this one, where I was looking for a pattern and I didn't see one. Okay. Oops. Moving around here. I could go and when I'm in a pivot table, notice up above there are pivot table tools. There's a design tab, sort of like we had with a pivot with just a regular table, a design tab, and an analyze tab. What's in these? What's in the analyze tab? A whole bunch of different things. Um, slicers are neat, but we don't really need to get into them. That there's one over here called pivot chart. Click on it. It's making up a chart for my table, and it'll allow me other types of charts. But it starts out generally with a column chart, and if you've got both rows and columns in your, it'll be a what's called a clustered column chart. And I'm going to make it smaller so we can see it on our screen here with everything else. And so it's taken what I had for rows and made that the horizontal axis. And then for each of these ones, like with high school, it'll show me what I had in columns. So females and males. And then for college students, the next row, what are the first column, the second column, and then the third row, first column, second column, and the fourth row, first column, second column. And I can start seeing the pattern that's here. You can play with all kinds of things here. If I ever had gender that was blanks, I didn't show, I could click on it and show them if I wanted to. Okay, so uh, looks like <laughs> there aren't many blanks and they seem to be college students and bachelor degree students, none in graduate programs or in high school, but I can throw in that extra one there. And back here in my table, You'll notice I've got a new column back. Uh, the blank column is there. Let me get rid of that. I don't like that one. And um, with parents education, I form groups. And I took out these guys okay, that, that were unsure, didn't know. And then you'll notice, here's the categories. See, I've got two variables here. This is the original parent's education. Then I've got the one that I've shown here that's been grouped. It's created like a new variable called parent education three. That I can go and change these things around in my chart. It'll show up in my table. I can change them in my table. It'll show up in my chart, which is a really neat trick. So we're going to wrap it up here for today that we've covered an awful lot that you can start seeing the power of these pivot tables and maybe pivot charts. And we've gone through the basics of how do you pick rows, columns, how you can do some of the formatting, filtering, shifting rows around or columns around, hiding things, grouping things. There's a lot of little tools you can do. There are a few warnings I would add to this though that your summary measures you've got are only estimates. So they're not always super accurate. They may be, if you've got a big sample. Don't read too much though into small differences for the big patterns that are there. Make sure you haven't sliced your data up into too many groups because you start with 750 values, hide ones that are sort of odd, split up what's left, and then you end up with groups of only 20 and 50 or something, not 700. So when I had 700, I could measure things accurately within $1,600. But when I've only got 50, 
maybe I can only measure things within about $3,000 or $4,000. That's a big difference. And they're more wishy-washy estimates. Watch out that when you're hiding rows and columns, you are doing filtering. Okay? And you may not remember that you've done those sorts of things. And again, you're hiding data. You don't have the whole data set that you thought you did. So what's next? Well, uh, there are a couple things. We did grouping. Can you group numeric variables? Think of a frequency distribution. It's taking numbers and putting them into groups. Can't we do that here? We can. And it's a slick way of doing a histogram. That what if we were just looking at categorical variables? That looking at program and gender and how many students do different things. That what can we see in those sorts of things? And that ends up being a really important area of, of inquiry that we want to look into. What percentage of people do this or percentage of people do that? And the charts, again, can be very useful. But once we get into percentages, it gets more complicated to interpret the table and to interpret the chart. So that's it. We're all done. That uh, I hope you got some sense. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. I want to stop recording.